The following episode of Let's Connect contains coarse language and content that is not recommended or suitable for children's listening. Singer-songwriter Haley Jean Penner's memoir takes a brutally honest yet humorous look at the dark, intimate truths we spend our lives running from. Like a map of beautiful mistakes, Haley's stories of questionable sexual encounters, artistic aspirations, and emotional abuse trace her coming of age in the music industry. Haley explores all her relationships, and I mean all her relationships, from her childhood as the daughter of celebrity Fred Penner, to the destructive and coercive relationship with her boss, to an encounter with an actor that we all know but we mustn't name, and brings them all together in a series of sharp, touching vignettes. People You Follow is the name of the book, and it straddles the delicate boundary between ethical and unethical behavior self-protection and self-destruction, power and weakness, giddiness and despair. And joining me today on the podcast is Haley Jean Penner, and I couldn't be more excited. I've known Haley for a number of years. Um, Actually, we go way back to when I was playing music. Uh, I think I must have been around 20 years old playing at uh, a church basement every Sunday at Holy Rosary Church, and Haley used to come with her family. That's where we first met, and uh, I have fond memories of, of Haley back then. It's amazing, you know, people you follow. I, I just finished reading Haley's book, and it is an incredible read. I highly recommend you going to check it out. Um, but reading this book, I had no idea the stories and the situations that Haley was living uh, underneath the surface, you could say. So um, today, Haley's going to be on the show, and we're going to be speaking about what the process was like to write such a vulnerable, real book that, um, honestly, I think it's one of the most vulnerable books I've ever read, what that process was like and uh, how she navigated the times of her life. So very excited to share that uh, conversation with you today on the podcast. Just before we get into it, I want to remind you to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Keith M. Mack, where I post videos of the podcast. You can also subscribe to the podcast itself on iTunes, Spotify, any device that you listen to podcasts on and any platform, uh, I should be there. And uh, also your comments, your questions, your guest ideas. If you have coaching questions as well, um, feel free to leave me a voicemail uh, at the podcast site, keithmcpherson.ca is my website, or you could also send me an email as well, keith at keithmcpherson.ca. I would love to hear from you and hear how this podcast is uh, reaching you and touching your heart. Um, so without further ado, everybody, we're going to jump right in today and meet Haley Jean Penner, author of People You Follow. All right, Haley Jean Penner, thank you so much for being here. And wow, it's just so great to see you after all these years again. I know, it's been like a decade. <laughs> Honestly, it's been, I think it's been more than a decade since I, I, I saw I you. I was trying to think of the last time I saw you and I don't, I don't have access to that memory. I don't know where it is. Yeah, I know. So much has happened to you since I last saw you. And I know that because I've been up uh, in the early hours of the morning reading your book. You've kept me awake past my curfew for like three nights in a row. Amazing, amazing. It's an amazing book and I'm so excited for people to be uh, to reading it. But I am, um, just to start, I wanted to, uh, just for people that aren't familiar with you and your story, they're going to find out a lot about you and your story yeah. in your book. But just yeah. take take me back to the the beginning of um, your story around music. I, I'm curious about what inspired you to even start a music career and, and get that all going. <sighs> I mean, how, I I think uh, first of all, I started because I grew up in like a very musical household. Like with my my father, it was just sort of surround. I was it was just what my home life looked like. Like my dad was on tour or we would visit him at, you know, at a show or in the studio. And then even when I wasn't with him, like my mom was a dancer, so we'd be visiting her at her dance studio. So I was very surrounded by the arts forever. But then I really think like my my own um, exploration with songwriting at, was at like 16. And I really think it had, it was so, it had like no ambition, no big ambitions. I was just like, how do I tell this person I'm in love with them without revealing to them that I'm in love with them? Like, how can I like secretly write a song and sing it to them and like hope they get it, hope they get it enough to then maybe fall in love with me too. Like, I really feel like it was just exclusively a path for me to express 
my feelings that I didn't know how to just say. And then eventually I did it enough times. It was like, oh, I like doing this. But I, it was not it was not a strategic move. Wow. <laughs> I could totally relate to this. Yeah. I feel like so many singer songwriters get into it just to be seen or to like express yeah. their love. Right. Oh, like, completely. I wasn't like, I'm going to write a hit today. Not never. I was just like, how do I tell him? How do I tell him I love him? <laughs> right. How did it transition from that to actually pursuing a career? I mean, I think even that, because I, I moved to Toronto when I was 19. So I moved out of Winnipeg when I was 19 to Toronto. And that was just in some ways to follow a guy. Like there's a, a guy who had just moved there that I loved. And yeah. I was like, I'm going to move to Toronto too. So then I moved to Toronto and I wasn't really doing music at that point. Um, and then I went to journalism school there and was like doing sort of like commercials and things, but I wasn't really like pursuing a musical career. And then, yeah. And then I met this, this, uh, manager in, in Toronto and I had just been like starting to kind of co-write, but really just with a couple people. And, and uh, so I had a couple songs like on hand and he, oh yeah. And then he was like, uh, uh, come to LA, come to, I'll, I'll bring you to LA. My brother's a big songwriter. If he likes you, you know, you can, you can stay, we'll sign you and it'll be great. Mm -hmm. So it just, I, I feel like in some ways I just sort of fell into it where I got here and I was like, yeah, I could, I could do this. This could be a, a thing I do. And then it was just like a six year boot camp. Yeah. That, it was like an education in a lot of things. Yeah, of there's like multi layers to your journey uh, into the music industry and then yeah. moving to LA seems like it was, that's a great word for it, boot camp. Life oh, lesson just, boot camp. Oh, yeah, it was a boot camp. Because all my other, like, I sort of dabbled with it through the years and even working with you with the Four Corners. Right. Your uh, old band. Yeah. My <laughs> or old acapella band. group. Acapella group, yeah. Right. Um, you know, it was like I dabbled, I dabbled, and then I, and then I just fell off the cliff into it. Wow. So I want to get into some of that right now. So the book, I mean, it puts it all out there. This is probably one of the most vulnerable books, to be honest, that I've ever read. I haven't read Fifty Shades of Grey. Neither have I. <laughs> really? All right. That makes two of us. And I don't suspect this is like that. But I mean, I, I've heard people reference Fifty Shades of Grey as being very graphic and very just to the point. But your book just puts it out there like so honestly and vulnerably. Like you're writing about things that I, I couldn't even believe you put on paper. I was like, Haley, wow, like how, how much courage does this woman actually have? Like, what made you write this book in the first place? I mean, what made me write this book is I, uh, I had like a sort of tough night with a friend of mine, like a really close friend of mine who I'd al always had feelings for. And then we, we had like a, you know, a night, one night, and it did not pan out the way I wanted it to, or I think even he wanted it to. And then I was just so heartbroken on the back of it. And we like wrote music together a lot. And I just, I was like, I do not feel like writing a song about this. I don't want to sit down and like pluck my acoustic guitar and sing sweetly about this situation. I'm hurt. I'm mad. I'm like all these things that I don't know how to put into music. Like I don't know how to be mad in music mm -hmm. and I don't know how to be, I don't know how to be like, br I, I mean, it, my songs are very honest, but I think there's something about my, even just about the tone of my voice, like my singing voice that makes everything sort of sweet. Yeah. Like I have a sort of sweet, voice and even my playing like I lean towards a sort of sweetness for my for my own music and I was just I just didn't want to do that I was like I don't feel like writing a sweet heartbroken compassionate love song I just want to say what happened like I don't I don't even want to tell you how to feel about it I just need to write out these things you know in the hopes kind of of not continuing to do the same things for the next 20 years you know I was like what you know and then in writing them out over and over again I just realized how deep these patterns are. Like it, it was really, it really felt like I sort of hired myself as my own kind of analyst and my whole wall in my kitchen was just like dots and pictures and, and things just trying to like crack the code of my own relationship life. Wow. You know, that was something I was curious about because I'm reading through your book and it feels like you're going through therapy as you're writing it. And like, were you working with a therapist or were you just your I, own I, therapist? 
I was, I was definitely working with a therapist at that, at that point, or I think we either started right after or right before. And then I was definitely also my own therapist and just trying to work out, work out my stuff in a way that would, yeah, hopefully change some patterns. In my head, as I was reading, I'm like, I wonder if the therapist had given Haley this as an assignment or something. I know, I know. No, was she, there any of that? No, not at all. But she, I, I recently, like four days ago, I sent her a copy of it, of the oh. book, because I thank her in the back too. And, and uh, I wrote her a little card that was like, I don't know, am I allowed to send you this? I wasn't sure if I was like, I was like, you already know, <laughs> but here you go, here's a look. Wow, that's another thing I'm curious about. I mean, this book really, like you do not leave anything off the table as far as I'm concerned yeah. reading this. Um, how, what, like so far, just in the advanced copies you've put out, like what's been the reaction from like your family, your friends? I mean, you, you really put it all out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. I've had, I, I feel like, all the responses are going to really like just surprise and amaze me. First of all, my parents are not allowed to read it. They've both been told they're not allowed. They it's haven't not, read this. No, no, and they're never, they're not allowed to. My parents aren't allowed. Haley, that's intense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And they both have a copy. So I, if they manage to not read it, I, that would be amazing. And also if they do, I will understand if they just need to. But no, I told them both explicitly, this is not a book for you. What was your why on that? Because I, I was like, I just tried to imagine myself as, you know, a father reading my daughter. I'm like, it's just not for you. It's just not a book for you. It's a book for everybody else. You just keep seeing me the way you see me. That would be preferable. To me. Wow. Are your parents aware that you wrote about them in the book? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. They are. And they know that like the graphic detail of what you get into? Yes, I think so. I, I think that's why they're both like, no problem. We won't read it. <laughs> wow. Unbelievable. But you have siblings, so much courage. Yeah. My siblings are all reading it. My siblings are all reading it. And and what's uh, been the reaction? Yeah, it's, it's the really interesting thing is I, I had a conversation with a, a good friend of mine the other day. And, and, um, and it's funny because we sort of weren't good friends before she read the book. And then she read it and she reached out and she was like, I feel so connected to you. And it was just this beautiful sort of connective tissue. And then I, we were on, on FaceTime and she brought out like a journal of all, she had started writing out all her patterns. And I was like, oh, that, it excited me so much that something, because I feel like that's, those are the books that I love the most when I read something and I'm like, and it just is, becomes a mirror. And I think that's also why there's like a freedom in writing so honestly about my own life because I think and it's the same with songwriting where if I write really honestly about my life you're only going to see your life mm. you're gonna, immediately it's going to flip around and you're going to be looking at yourself you're not going to be judging me for my shit you're going to be like oh I did a I did a gross thing too there you know yeah and I think in, in some ways that kind of like in being very vulnerable it also keeps me sort of safe because it's so yeah, it's, so, it's such like an empathetic exchange. You're like, yeah, me too, me too, me too, me too. Yeah, well, it does bring up a lot of questions around when you say me too, the me too movement. I mean, yeah. as I was reading through it, I was just getting perspectives about like, wow, how women treat or how men treat women, uh, the dynamics of relationships, the way the world is right now. It brought up like so many questions in my mind about where are we going in, in our world? You know, it's just, yeah. Did you yeah. know you were writing in that context as you were writing this? I mean, not really, and, and mostly because like I started writing this, uh, I guess like three years ago. So it was kind of right, right before M Me Too sort of started. And there is something sort of funny, I think may, that I, I imagine I'm not alone in feeling that I, I started writing the book and then the Me Too movement sort of hit. Mm -hmm. And, and I, there was like a moment of feeling like, oh fuck, I missed it. Like I, I, I missed my chance to be a part of this movement because I didn't write early enough. You know, like, like my issue won't matter in three years. You know what I mean? Like this wow. is the moment. And so it's so funny that sort of pressure you put on yourself. But, but I'm actually, um, yeah, my relationship to, I, I've thought a lot about, about the movement because obviously it's like a necess necessary adjustment in societal norms like really damaging, obviously. 
Um, and I think I really wanted to, with that sort of lens, look at not why, why just for myself, like why is the guy doing the awful thing? But like, why am I staying in this room? Because of course there's a bunch of layers to it and the power dynamics and all these things. But when I started looking at like the number of times I've done it, I was like, I can't, I can't exclusively blame you. I just can't. Mm -hmm. I have to, I have to in the hopes, even if, even if you're fully to blame, like I can't, it's not about blame. It's about trying to, trying to, for myself, trying to learn what I did and why I did it so that I can hopefully put myself you know, make changes in my own life. So. Wow. So at this point, after like putting out this book, have you, I'm curious if you've read it back. And I have, I, have. I got, I, I got a copy of it or I, I got like my, my sort of early, you know, 20 copies of it and I read it right away and I felt very, um, yeah, there's just nothing I wanted to change. I felt really like it was so, it's so honest and I feel so, um, I feel really grateful that I was able to be that honest. And I think that's the only thing I would have, I would have regret not being that honest, but not being that honest. You know what I mean? Right. There right. were moments where I, where I thought I was lying or where I wasn't being totally truthful. Then I think that could have kept me up at night, but yeah. How did how did you get yourself into the state of writing that honest and vulnerable? I mean, it, I've, I don't think I've ever read anything that honest and vulnerable. How did you get there? I, you know, it was, it was sort of an accident, like my writing process, but I'm, I, now I like swear by it, which is I, I would write, I would write and, uh, you know, one of these stories. And then immediately, even if it was in an early draft, I would record it just on my iPhone and then take it for a walk and just like go for a walk and listen to myself reading my own story to me. Wow. Because it was the only way I could make sure I wasn't lying to myself because writing, you can sort of like, you know, massage something in a way that kind of serves it up to you in a way that you can look at and read and believe. Mm. But there was something about the honesty of speaking that when I heard it in just in my headphones alone, walking, you know, through Winnipeg or LA or where, wherever, I was like, you don't mean that. You mm. don't mean that. You don't mean that. Go, you have to change that. So wow. I'd be like editing while walking and like talking to my past self and my future self and, you know, my AirPods. So, wow. So who have you discovered yourself to be in this process? Like, who are you? What a question, Keith. What a question. Um, who am I? I mean, I'm a very, I'm like, a, I'm like everybody. I'm like everybody else. I'm like a flawed, confused, not, I mean, not flawed because flaws aren't a real thing, but um, I'm just like a person trying to figure my, figure my stuff out and trying to mostly change my, mostly change my patterns in the hopes of learning something new. You know, like if I keep, if I keep going down the same sort of path, it'll be just as like exciting and tasty and, and, and like fun and dark and, and, you know, satisfying in a, in a toxic way, but I won't learn anything. I won't learn anything new. And I mm. really would like to continue learning new things. Mm. So that's the goal really. And I wouldn't be surprised. Like what have you discovered about yourself in the process of writing this book? What have I discovered? I mean, I've discovered a lot of things. I've discovered a lot of things surrounding, you know, growing up with a, with a famous dad, just like, especially because I tend to, I tend to fall for men who are very, very present and then far away and very, very present and, and far away. I noticed it's, that pattern as yeah. I was reading your book. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, and I sort of feel like I hadn't really thought it through because I have such an incredible father. Like he's so loving and kind and and always was like i have no complaints about the father that i got mm -hmm. and we should just name it to for people that don't know it. yeah fred penner fred penner the children's entertainer canadian icon yeah he's amazing parenting icon um but it's funny because i thought i've been thinking back on like 
because that was a big question. Like, where did this start? I have a great dad. Like, yeah. where did this start? I have a great father. But then I really thought of, you know, like he started touring heavily when I was, when I was a kid. And for a kid, you don't really understand what's happening. So all you know is like, dad's here, dad's here, dad loves me, this is the best. And then the next day, dad's just gone for, oh. you know, for three weeks. And you might not, you know, then there's this moment of like, did I, did I do something? Like, did I do something wrong? Like, is there something that I did that I didn't pick up on that mm. I don't realize I did? And then he comes back and you're so happy to see him. You don't want to waste time being like, I was really hurt for the last three weeks. So you're just like, yay, let's go to the park and have a good time. And then you have a good time and then he leaves again. And you're like, I did it again. Like I did it again. I did it again. What did I do? What did I do? So it creates this sort of like, pattern of being comfortable with somebody being really present and then being really far away wow. and it starts to feel like home so i think that's why i you know i've found all these partners who are like super in and available and then super far because that feels totally fine to me it feels wow. like home and comfortable and right to me yeah what a discovery as you're noticing yeah. this pattern so that's something you've discovered is oh, yeah, that, that was a that was a major discovery for sure and like, now that you know that, I mean, I'm just curious, like, what's your current dating situation like? Oh, gosh. Well, you know, I've dated. I'm dating. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, it's funny because I'm trying to, I'm trying to do the opposite of what, um, of what my instincts are. I'm trying to like, when I have an instinct, I'm trying to go like, shush, shush instinct. You know, like I, I, like I was seeing somebody or am seeing somebody who, uh, want, like I know will want to do nice things for me. And that makes me incredibly nervous. Like, cause especially now going into fall, there's like going to be a bunch of, you know, it's like the book and the album and then my birthday and then, and then like Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. And it fills me with anxiety because I'm like, he's going to want to do all these nice things for me. Can I handle these nice things like that mm. the thought of somebody being like consistently present in there terrifies me so i'm trying to just i'm mm. trying to like fight my my commitment phobia apparently mm -hmm. and also yeah what well, i'm just curious like what terrifies you about being loved yeah, by somebody it doesn't it doesn't make sense keith i don't have the answer to that i think it's i don't know i think i'm not i'm just very out of practice like really my last like committed relationship, committed like we are a couple relationship was like 10 years ago. Wow. But this is what happens in LA. LA is a cesspool. I mean, I love LA, but it's very easy to just sort of like stay in these like committed but non-committed kind of things. And then you like meet somebody else and you just like, it just sort of is a city like that. It's a very odd city for love. And I don't think I'm, I'm alone in, in feeling that way. Um, so it's, it's hard. It's like, you really, you have to sort of challenge the idea that like that is right or good or something or satisfying or like fully satisfying. Mm, yeah. Well, I really sense like <laughs> that's gotta be a challenge to be navigating through. I mean, it's, you talk a lot in your book too about just towards the end. And I was so hoping that you were going to have like an epiphany moment because of yeah. all of the, the challenging situations you'd been in with relationships, but you really talk about self-love. Yeah. I, cause I had, there was, there were alternate versions of the end uh -huh. and there were a couple that were like epiphany, sort of epiphany versions. Uh -huh. and then I was like, That's not true though. Like I, I, just because I've noticed all, all of my patterns, like doesn't just automatically give me a ticket, a ticket out of them. Mm -hmm. Like that will be a continued practice of going like, Okay, you see the thing you're doing now. Mm -hmm. You have the tools to like veer in a different direction or, or don't you? Mm. you know? so, so I don't I, want it to be like a bow on the end. I want it to be like, okay, yeah. still working on it. <laughs> Which I think is one of the most endearing things about you that I, I like, it's just so real. It's so you're being so honest and truthful with yourself, which I think is incredible. Thank um, you. When you like think of the practice of self-love, like what, what does that look like for you these days? I mean, it's, it's I, I feel like that's also a thing that I've had. I've, I've in the same way that I'm like, I have a great, I have a great dad. What's the deal? Because I, I feel like I have a very healthy 
relationship to self-love. Like I've, you know, exercised every two days since I was 18. I know you, you like take jogs like you're in a movie every single day. I, like, <laughs> like I love it. <laughs> we went for a long run one time. I remember that was like the, the first long run I've ever done. Really? Was, yeah. I remember I, that. I yeah. Like, yeah, we ran like through this neighborhood. It's so funny. I was laughing just on a side note because when I was reading the book you'd reference, you said, every time I go on a run, I feel like I'm being filmed in a movie. And I, I remember you saying that back in the day too. It's like, right on, Haley. <laughs> You've made it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I feel like, you know, I, 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 like sleep is very important to me. I cook a lot. I bake a lot. I'm very close with my family. You know, I make it a point to even when I'm in LA, I talk to my, like the first thing I do every morning in LA is call Danica and we like FaceTime first thing in the morning. So I'm very good at that, those sort of like really, really like typical self-care practices like eating well, sleeping, exercising, family, love, alone time. Like I'm mm -hmm. really good at those things and I really love those things and value those things. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of relationships, I'm curious, because you speak a lot in the book about just brokenheartedness and how guys have just totally taken advantage of you and how you've made wrong decisions. It goes on and on. It's like, oh my goodness. Um, I'm just like so curious in that, in that regard. Um, if you were to go back and talk to the earlier version of yourself at this point, like if you were to drop back into any of those scenes, what would you tell her? I mean, the truth is I wouldn't, I really wouldn't tell her anything. I, I would, I would be like, you have to go through this. And I, and I even like, I look back on my, on my um, Win Winnipeg self as, as like an 18, as an 18 year old. And I just really felt like I had it all figured out. <laughs> I was like, I've never had to struggle. I'm comfy. I have a great family. I sort of, I don't, I don't need anything I don't have. I make friends easily. Life's fine. Life's good. Like it's okay. So I'm so, I'm deeply grateful to LA for just kicking the out of me. Yeah. Really? Because it just, it just leveled me in this way that now I feel like you know, like I, when I was living in Toronto, I remember I was house sitting for a friend and she came home sort of distraught one day. And she said, she said, I just found out my boyfriend cheated on me. And 22 year old Haley was like, that's it. It's over forever. You're out. You're never talking to again, him again, blah, blah, blah. And I don't even kind of feel like that anymore. How Not would you say, how do you feel now? <laughs> now I feel like, okay, so let's have a conversation about this. Why did it happen? You know, like, who was it with? Uh, what's the deeper issue here? Was he just, was it just like a random thing? Does it even matter? Like, is it okay that that's, I don't know, like, because I sort of think those betrayals like aren't at all about sex. They're about, they're just about the betrayal. They're about lying. They're about feeling like somebody has been, yeah, lying to your face and going to sleep beside you. Like, that's the thing especially I think for women that will, that will kill us. Mm. Is if we feel like somebody's just been lying to your face. It's not about, it's not about the sex. I really don't think it is. Mm -hmm. but yeah, now I just don't feel like, I, I think, I think more than my feeling about it changing, it's that I have no judgment for that situation anymore. I have zero judgment for the cheater or the person who's getting cheated on. Like it's not, it's not a sign of a bad person. It's just, it's just like, a thing that happens for whatever number of reasons. And I'm really grateful for that. I'm really grateful that my, my sort of pain and struggle has turned into just a complete, a complete lack of judgment. I just said, you could tell me you did anything at all. And I would just have no judgment. And it, it doesn't mean necessarily wow. that I'd be able to be like a close friend of yours. If you were like, I murdered a person, right. you know, maybe wouldn't be tight. But I would want to under I would want to hear you. I'd want to like understand like yeah. that movie Dead Man Walking where she's like interviewing this like I'm so curious about why people do bad things that aren't bad you know bad things yeah but why people go to dark places. So so why no judgment now? I think because I've I've now been in positions that I never ever ever would have seen myself in and and especially as like the other woman for several years, 
I never would have seen myself as like this stereotypical picture of of what an affair looks like. Like mm. I don't I don't feel like I but that's the thing it's like these are all stereotypes of like what does that woman look like or or seem like or or whatever but I I never related to that. I I felt like I had very like clear uh, morals and whatever. So to have been in this situation where I've now done so much that I never thought I was capable of being a part of, mm -hmm. it really changes your perspective on like, okay, well, I think, I think I'm a good person. I know I'm a good person. I, you know, I, I care about the people I love. I care about people I don't love, you know, like I'm kind to servers. Like I'm a good, I'm a good person, mm -hmm. but I've also done all these things that I'm not totally proud of, but I'm grateful for. So yeah, it just sort of levels judgment. Do you have any regrets? No, no, zero. Wow. None. I mean, I have one regret, which was I had a, got a very, very, very bad haircut like four years ago. And it <laughs> devastated me. Like a whole year, <laughs> whole year, I couldn't look in the mirror. I was devastated. Like wow. those, those are the type of regrets I have. Like we went on a trip once and I forgot to bring like a certain type of chips. That is upsetting. I'm like, why? I could have <laughs> why didn't I bring that type of chip? Like I don't have right. big, big regrets because it feels like it feels a little bit like um whatever, you know, like the butterfly effect. You go back and you kill a butterfly and your whole life is different. Yeah. And I really, really believe that. Like I can't I can't be happy in this moment while going back in time and changing anything at all because it's all really influenced to where I am now. Yeah, it's like actually perfectly on time in the most bizarre way, isn't it? Yeah, in the most bizarre way. Yeah, wow. When you were reading back the book, I just currently, um, if you were to think of one of your favorite moments in the book, just to, to, to share that with the listeners and, and people watching. I have, I have um, I mean, I have a couple of favorite, favorite moments. One of them is one of the first stories I wrote, which is it's uh, called the, the Standard Hotel Room 911. And it's like at the end of the, I'm in, with this guy named Daniel and, and, and the line is like, uh, he stood naked in a fancy hotel room in the middle of the night on a one night stand and ate an entire box of Oreos. Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> I just, it was such a funny moment because we were literally on a one night stand. He was like a famous, like just approaching real like fame. And I'm in his, in this like fancy hotel in LA, like downtown. And I was like, what is he, what is he doing? And I sort of opened my eyes and he's naked and he's like stumbling against the walls. And then I just hear like, <laughs> like, <laughs> what is happening? I sort of saw like, just saw him like nibbling, like at a campsite. It was so funny and then in the morning. He, he, yeah. He asked me, he was like, did you hear me? Did you hear me have my snack last night? I was like, yeah, I heard you have your snack. What was it about that moment for you that like you love or you it appreciate just, the most? It was so, it was so, um, it was like a need he had that he just addressed. Like regardless of who is nearby, he was just like, this is a thing I want and need. I'm going to go get the thing I want and need. <laughs> wow. And I just think it's so funny. And also I think so many parts of that book are me not doing that. Are me going like, here's a thing I want and need. Don't do that. Don't do that thing you want and need. Don't do that. Don't like, so to see somebody just go like, I want a box of Oreos right now. I don't care it's the middle of the night. I don't care that I have a stranger in my bed in a fancy hotel room and I might not see you ever again. I want to go eat a snack. Like, I wow. respect that. Wow, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'm curious about that, just this um, up and coming celebrity that you were dating and he's nameless. You, you can't name him. And... I can't, I won't. But I'm just curious, like, because you met him on what you call the celebrity dating app. So funny. I really can say what it is. I'm not. You can't say what it is, but I'm just. It is. It's called Raya. It's like not. It's really. I don't even think it's like a, a celebrity dating app anymore. But it's kind of what it is. Like. Can like, you explain this? I I was just like so curious when you can go on there and date celebrities. Yeah, kind of. It's like. <laughs> I feel like it's mostly male celebrities and women, and just women, just females. Um. Wow. It's very, yeah, it's a strange place. You just swipe like, you know, like John Mayer's on there. Just like people. People are on there. No kidding. Yeah, you just, you just like them. And then maybe they like you too. And then you have a chat. <laughs> What's your take? I mean, in the book, you talk about, um, I can't remember how old you were, but you were writing on a piece of paper 
two things that you wanted the most out of life, fame and uh, was it dating Paul or being Yeah, a, dating or, Paul, Paul's love. <laughs> yeah, and then you threw it out the window and it magically comes back to you, which yeah. you, people can find out in the book. Yes, um, yes. You were like really driven to be famous at an early age. What was I, that all about? I don't, I mean, it's funny because I have, I've, I've found, because we moved out of my childhood home sort of, I mean, if, if several years ago. But 303. In, I remember it well. <laughs> um, but in doing that, obviously, you end up going through like boxes and boxes of childhood stuff. And I found so many journals that I just thought were so funny, where I wrote like, there was one where I wrote a, um, I wrote a book, like I wrote a, a autobiography at like 11. And it was an assignment for school, but it was supposed to be it was supposed to be like five pages long. And I wrote this like, 30 page story about my life that's like I married Leonardo DiCaprio in it um we both won uh we both won Academy Awards the same year adorable um and then both of our families died together on the same flight that we weren't on so it was like a whole it was a whole thing but and that was sort of besides the point that wasn't what I was getting at what I was getting at was I found all these journal entries that kept saying like everybody thinks I should be a singer, but I'm not a singer. I'm an actress. I know that I'm an actress and I need to be an actress. <laughs> I don't know. I think I was just like, I was sort of obsessed with actors forever. Wow. Like I just, I love acting. I love watching actors. I think I also don't think I'm alone in like musicians wanting to be actors and actors wanting to be mus- musicians. Sure. Like I've never really acted, but I believe that I am an actor. Oh, Haley, I think you'd be an, you're an, you're, you are an incredible actress and I could see it. But, but actually like to be famous, like just the, yeah. the yearning to be famous from yeah. a young age. Well, I'm curious in your perspective, what is that about? I mean, I think uh, of course a part of it, it comes from being raised with a person who is famous. Yeah. I think also that desire has definitely faded. I think I, it was more important to me as a kid it was more important to me as a young person because I think I equated uh, fame with success. Mm -hmm. And now I just don't at all. Like now there's so many people who I really see as successful, like myself included, who I am not famous, you know, but it's like what I value in a career has really changed. But I think as a kid, you don't really, you can't really see like the nuance of, of like, yeah people's people's careers or creativity or like okay maybe that person isn't the most well-known person in the world but they own a home and Mm. have a beautiful life and a family and and like are making their life off the thing they love like that's success that's huge success yeah so it just sort of changed it it kind of morphed got it i know some people are going to be curious and they'll email me if i don't ask you about just some stories growing up as a dad that's fred penner yeah. And people listening in the U.S., Fred Penner is a Canadian children's entertainer, very well known. All of us grew up watching him on TV. Yeah. I'd love for you to, sh- I mean, you share a few stories in the book that are hilarious about growing up with him, but just, just to recount it a little bit, what was it like to be uh, the daughter of Fred Penner? I mean, it was, it was, I feel very... I think I got the best, uh, like my brother got really bullied. Damien got quite bullied for a while about it. Um, and I think my sisters too sort of sort of struggled with it from time to time. And f- for whatever reason, I, I just, I didn't really, like I didn't really get bullied about it or that my bullying was really short lived. So for the most part, my relationship to it was just this like, in hindsight, kind of damaging like early thing where where I really felt really special, where I felt like, you know, I, I can make friends who I've never met before and they come over and they're like in awe of my, of like my dad. Mm-hmm. So there is a kind of thing that happens where you're like, oh, I got, I have like an ace. Like I don't have to be, it doesn't have to all sit on my shoulders. I can just be like, look, look at him, look at him. Like if I don't have anything to say, I can just check, yeah. check it out. Fred you know? Penner, yeah. You know, so it's, and that's another reason why I'm, I'm really grateful to LA is like going to a place where like, nobody cares. Nobody knows who he is. Nobody cares. It doesn't matter. It's like, you're there, you have to pave your own way. And, 
I think in a way that sort of subconsciously I was, I was looking for that. I was looking for like, okay, I have to, I have to make my own, my own world. And it is so interesting that like in creating my own world, you know, you return home to, to branch out or you branch out by returning home. Yeah. Um, but yeah. I love, <laughs> just on a side note, I love how you accidentally have arrived back in Winnipeg over the last few months. It's bananas. It is bananas to me. It's also crazy because I started writing this book in Winnipeg. I was on a flight to Winnipeg and everything, it all started here. Like the first stories were written here, walking past this place, like listening to it. So to be here now by accident, totally by accident, like I was here for a trip top of March, pandemic hit. I was like, I'm not going back right now. Why would I go back right now? I'm going to stay here. And now it's been what, six, six months, six months. And I'm here and I'm so grateful because it's just the most, especially even though my parents aren't allowed to read it, in, in, in releasing something so vulnerable and honest, I'm so grateful to be in like the safest possible place in the world. I mean, <laughs> my dad's home where I'm living on my own because he's in, in, in BC. My siblings are all 10 minutes away in either direction. My mom's down the street. You know, she like brings over cooked meals sometimes i'm just like taken care of here which is really nice in in, in preparing to like de-skin myself and be like what do you guys think you know yeah absolutely well i mean the book is about to come out as we're doing this conversation and i i can only imagine what uh, yeah. kind of acclaim is going to come in the next few months for you. Thank you for people that are reading this book um what is your hope for the, like the reader I mean, yeah, really my hope is, is that it, that it does sort of, sort of shine a mirror on yourself and that it makes you kind of reflect on your own sexual history and family history. And, and it makes you like more curious about yourself, that it makes you want to like put in the time and like string up all of your exes on, on a whiteboard in your kitchen and be like, wow, why did I do that? Like, really, why did I do that? Like, why did I make that decision at that time? Because I just think uh, above all else, I think I'm like driven by curiosity, which is also why I get into kind of dysfunctional situations sometimes, because I'm so curious about stuff and people and places and things. So that's my hope. My hope is that people are like, ooh, I want to investigate myself. Wow. And in terms of what you're like dreaming about is next, uh, what, what are you, what are you yearning for? What are you wishing for next? Oh man. Well, lots of things. I'm, I'm constantly writing music. You know, I'm, I'm working with a bunch of people that I think are incredible, like incredible young artists. I want to write another book, not for myself. I'm sort of, I am working on another book, not for myself. I won't tell you who it's for, but I'm writing a, like it's somebody else's. You're a ghostwriter. I'm a, I'm a ghostwriter, yeah. I don't know in the sky. Much. I'm a ghostwriter in the sky. Perfect. Wow! That was your dad's song. <laughs> Big hit. <laughs> wow. Wow, wow, wow. I have to tell my dad that. Yeah, so I'm working on a book. Um, yeah, sort of like memoir for somebody else with somebody else, um, which is like, just also happened to really rev up when I got to Winnipeg. So now like we talk every, you know, day or so and we FaceTime for a few hours and then I write and then we write together. And it's like the best, it's the best thing ever because I'm so hooked on writing like this now, but also I have no interest in writing another thing about me for like a minute. Mm. So it, it's perfect. It's just perfect. I, I couldn't be happier. It really, it really worked out. That's amazing. Okay. There's yeah. a few more questions coming in here that I have to ask you. Yeah. Your writing style, you referenced early on bone by bone, which is an incredible or you know, bird by bird. I'm thinking of writing down the bones by yeah, Natalie yeah. Goldberg. The bones with the birds and the birds. And then there's birds by bird, bird by yeah. bird. It's this yeah. incredible how to write book. You yeah. reference it in like the first few sentences yeah. of your book. Yeah. And you continue through the whole book to seem to write in that kind of prose, like the Natalie Goldberg kind of style. Um, yeah, she, uh, not, not Natalie, but um, Anne Lamont. Yes. Uh, that book just like, it just, I just think it's, I haven't read that many books about writing, but that book just, I think I read it on a morning where I wanted to, I wanted to like sit down and, and put in the time, but I wasn't coming super easily to me that morning. And usually for this process, because it was a total experiment and I wasn't at any sort of 
time frame at all. If I didn't feel like writing, I just didn't. Or I, I would just like go for a walk or try to creatively stimulate myself some other way. So that morning I just didn't feel like writing and I was like, I'm just gonna read this. And I read, you know, three chapters and was like, oh, this, and then, then I just sat down and started writing and kind of never stopped writing. Cause she's just, she's so good. It's the best writing book. It's so generous and, oh, it's so good. Wow. Everybody read that, that book. Anybody the, who has any interest in writing should read that. Yeah, and, and your writing style too is the same way. I feel like the detail that you get into and the way that you describe, like just the memory, like how did you remember all the specific details of, of things as you were writing this? It's incredible. It's, it's, I don't know. It just, I have, I, I feel like I have a very good memory in general. But more than that, I feel like because I was picking these moments that were incredibly uh, influential mm. um, and significant in my life, like I'm sure you could in detail go back to some memory of like the first time you got bullied or like pushed or kissed or, you know, they're really heightened memories. So to sit down and like close your eyes and really put yourself in that space and start saying it out loud, like, oh yeah, those stairs were blue or those stairs with da, 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 and like you, you know you sort of it just kind of comes back together and I think there's also a part of that too where I, I didn't let myself get hung up on like wait was that staircase blue wait no, no no it was green I was like no it was blue it was who cares like nobody's gonna fact check whether my my you know my home staircase on Waverly was blue or green or whatever it doesn't matter like that's not the point yeah the point like be in that space and try to inhabit it as much as possible in, in the hopes of really feeling like I'm back there and maybe reminding me of certain things. And also in the hopes of reminding you of personal spaces in your life that you've left. Yeah, absolutely. Do you have any ambition of this book becoming a movie? Uh, this book, not Hush Hush because we're on a podcast, but we're in the process of making it, of, of turning it into a series, not a, into a movie. Oh, incredible. I'm so yeah. excited to watch this. Will you actually be acting in it or is it you? Well, I really want to be in it, but I don't want to play me. I want to oh. play, I want to either play like an executive, like an executive, or there was a, there was a time where I thought maybe I wanted to be um, like my therapist, but I think I'm, I'm much too young. Like I want my therapist to be like 60 something, like a wise sort of elder. Um, so, but I, I definitely want to be in it, but I don't want to play myself. Wow. I love this. This is like fulfilling your dream of being an actress, a producer, a writer. <laughs> we barely talked about music. I just want to speak a little bit about this as well, just because it's important. Yes. You just are releasing, uh, if I understand, a full length album? Yeah. So the full album. Wow. Comes on Prolific. Eight. Thanks. Um, it's funny because the album was sort of written before the book, but it's about the same, like they're about the same things. So the album comes out on the 18th. The uh, book comes out in Canada on the 19th. And then we have Apple is doing like an exclusive ebook that connects the two. So like you'll be reading the ebook and then it'll link to the song that's about that chapter. Wow. Because they're so intertwined. Like a bunch of times in the book too, I reference songs that then will be like, you'll be able to listen to the song I'm talking about in the book. Yeah. So it's a very, uh, yeah. Well, as we're talking, it's September 2020 right now. So people yeah. listening in the future. But yes. um, I noticed that you just put out this week a, a video for people you follow, your, your mm -hmm. single, your song, yeah. but also the title of the book. And it's, I believe your sister is doing this beautiful piece. And I started watching that right after I finished reading your book. Like the timing mm -hmm. was impeccable. And I'm, wow. I'm watching the, uh, the video and I'm like tearing up and I've got chills and I'm like, to, wow. to bring the music to life in the book. And I can only imagine a TV series like, Haley, this is so creative. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. It's, it's amazing too with the, with the video. I'm, I'm particularly happy in, in this last like chapter of getting everything organized. It's become such a family affair. Like my brother shot that video, Kendra's dancing. And then also the cover of the book itself, Kendra took that photograph in this room I'm in and Danica designed the cover. Wow. So it's just my whole family is so it like it's so intertwined in the release of this book in the way in a way that makes it feel like not even only mine cuz Dan like Danica's a graphic designer but also a stay-at-home mom and runs a daycare and she does all these things so for her to be able to like express herself 
creatively through through this and then for my brother he's also a parent and and works full time and like is a, t a teacher and and works with kids with special needs and for him to be able to also like express creativity through this and then Kendra who's a photographer just felt like I'm so grateful to have been able to like give or or to make some sort of thing that all of us can jump in on and be creative be creative with and it's just it 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 I feel I feel like it just made it so much so much better just like the product itself yeah. in having all these hands of people I love being like what about this what about this what about this you know people you follow is the name of the book and and the single right now um can you share a little bit about the perspective? Why, why did you call the book that? What does it mean? There's, I sense there's a number of different ways you can interpret yeah. it. There are, there are a few different ways. The, the sort of, um, there's like the, the obvious kind of social media one where it's like you, you know, it's like literally the, the category is like people you follow. Right. You choose to look at. And, and, and then also just like, that's kind of how I see life in general. It's that, like life is just a series of people you follow to places and then the places you end up stuff happens and then that's your life kind of. Mm -hmm. So it's sort and especially in this book where I feel like a lot of it is me just going like, Oh, you sure. Like you sure. You know, just me like literally being letting myself and following these people kind of all over the world. Like that's why I moved to Toronto. That's why I moved to LA. Like that's why that's sort of what guided a lot of these a lot of these like big life shifts so yeah that was that was really the the driving force behind that title wow it's amazing to like just know you on one level and then to know all this other stuff that's happened that i was never aware of you know and it, it got me thinking about social media and how you know we see certain people posting things online but then we don't really know the extent of what's going on under the surface oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. I mean, I even look back on some pictures from the time that I'm writing about, like the first five years when I was in LA and I look like, to me, I look like something's going on, but I can also see reading that as like, oh, and I remember even coming back to Winnipeg when I first moved to LA. Cause I think there's this sort of thing where it's like, just by moving to LA, you've sort of made it. Yes. I all. know. You can move to <laughs> People would be like, good for you for moving to LA. I'm like, you too can move to LA and live in a basement. Like it's not that hard. Right. Come on over, yeah, know? come on down. It's really glamorous here. <laughs> really, I live in a basement apartment. <laughs> it's gross. Um, yeah, so I think looking back on those pictures, I'm like, wow, I was not. And I think that's also why it, it's hard for my siblings, like particularly my sisters, because I think a lot of that time I didn't talk to them about. I wasn't really, I wasn't going like, this is happening, this is happening, because I think there's also the way you kind of stay in those situations is by not talking about them is by not going like this just happened. It doesn't feel right. Like yeah. it kind of takes, at least for me, it took years of those like, Hey, that doesn't feel right things to happen in order for me to go like, so this has been happening for five years. And I think maybe I, it needs to stop mm. you know, because if you say it sort of throughout, throughout, then maybe you'll get out sooner and maybe you're not ready to, to escape yet or you don't know how or whatever i sense there's so many people in that scenario especially women i suspect that are in in relationships or situations where it's almost become like an addiction or the attraction and the allure but then it's like so bad and it's like totally and yeah because there's a part of it that's very sexy and exciting and then there's a part of it that you literally just don't know what to do like there were several times where I tried to get myself out of it, but particularly in the situation I was in where it was a whole camp, like it was a camp of people keeping, keeping the lie afloat, keeping, keeping the whole infrastructure kind of in place. So to be like the one person who steps up and goes like, I don't think I like this anymore. It didn't even feel like I, I, it did not feel like a possibility to me. And because they were the only people I knew in LA, I couldn't, I just had no vision. And I also just think that's what happens in abusive relationships in the first place that you just sort of get like nothing else exists. I'm like, if it's not them, what do I have? I have nothing I have. And especially when it's then tied into your career and my like uh, ability to even work in the States. Cause they were the names on my, on my petition, like they were my petitioners to stay in the country. So like, it was so, it was so hard for me to see 
keeping my life there, which I was, which I wanted very badly and had wanted for a long time, keeping my life there and also creating any sort of boundary or making healthier choices for myself or anything. Wow. Yeah. You know, you recount uh, later on in the book, you, you're in conversation with Ben. Uh, you like, you revisit each other after like just ironically on the street. Yeah. And I actually printed this out. I want to read it because it was just a very powerful moment in your book. Oh, I would love it. Um, so just to put this in preface or in, in context, you're, this is somebody you've dated. It's been a long time. He kind of walked out of your life unexpectedly. It was done and you've run into him on the street and there's sort of, you're in this place of, wow, maybe I should just continue this pattern and we should have a hookup. So it's, like, it's what I kind of got from what I was reading. And you say, I could see that by him saying no, I was freed. When I'm not trying to get something from someone, when I'm not trying to shape myself into something I think might suit someone, I make space to feel everything I've been trying not to feel. When I remove motive, I make space to be angry and hurt. I make space to miss him. I make space to love him. I make space to forgive him. That was like, Oh, and as I was reading it, I just, I was thinking about forgiveness too. And I'm just curious what forgiveness means to you. Oh, and I mean, forgive, forgiveness, I feel like I have almost two, I, I've, I've discussed forgiveness with a couple close friends many times because it's, it's, I feel like I sort of lead with forgiveness like people cannot ask me for forgiveness or apologize even. And it's just, I am, I, here it is. You got it from me. Like I don't hold like none of the men in that book. I have no hard feelings for any of them. Like I, I care for them all. I am grateful to them all. And I definitely forgive them all. Absolutely. But many of them have never asked me for forgiveness. And I had one very good com or a conversation with a close friend of mine at one point who said, who said like, there has to be a point where if somebody's really hurt you, that they ask you for that, for that like redemption, for that you come in and you say like, you acknowledge the thing you did, like in a sort of, in a sort of churchy way, mm -hmm. like kind of going to, going to, uh, um, you know, you sin in the thing, you say your sins, what is it? What is it? Confession. 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 You know, I acknowledge that the thing I did was, was this, I acknowledge that this happened and I'm sorry. And can I, you know, I would like your forgiveness. And I think, I think perhaps a few times in my life, I haven't waited for that moment because I don't like holding, I don't like holding that. So I just lead with sort of forgiveness first, which I do think is very valuable and I'm happy to have that skill. Um, and I'm happy to not carry, carry stuff around with me, but also I think it's important to, to, and I think especially with him, because he did, he went like, all of that happened. I really hurt you. He was like, I really, and I think that's maybe why I'm the closest of all the men in the book. We are the closest friends. Like he and I are, are very, very good friends. And I think it's because he was able to go, that was bad. Like that was a bad time. Mm -hmm. This really happened. I really hurt you. And, and I acknowledge that. And mm. I didn't even realize I needed that because I never ask anybody for it. I'm like, it's fine. It's fine. I, I Paul, it's fine. I forgive you. Right. Wow. That's really profound what you're saying. And it's such a practice to yeah. move into the humbleness to, to forgive and to be forgiven too, mm -hmm. to allow ourselves to be like both, both sides of the fence. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. One, one final thing, Enzo, your uncle Enzo. <laughs> wow, what a character. Um, there was just something that you said in, in the chapter about him that just really uh, landed for me. You said, um, I have to lose you to love me. Uh, I have to lose you to love me. Can you just share a little bit about what that means to you? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that is sort of connected to the, this idea that when you remove motive, you can, be, you can be sort of fully yourself. And I think in, in, wanting to keep him and not just not just him but many of the men in my life i've had to sort of i've had to sort of um yeah sort of shift myself into a different thing because i know what you're capable of 
So I'm like, I know that he can't handle more than this. I know that I need to be this free or expectationless or whatever in order to keep you around. But in doing that, I am quite actively not loving huge, you know, portions of myself because I don't think a person can handle it or take it. And rather than going like, okay, well then I'm going to take all my stuff somewhere else where somebody is capable of making space for it. Instead of that, I'm just going to like tuck that away and be here for you. So I think there is a, there is a part of that where until you kind of go like, okay, I love you and I can't keep you. Like realizing that those two things can coexist was I think also a big sort of realization in the last couple of years that I can go like, I love you, goodbye. Like I don't, I can't, I, I can't keep you though I love you still, you know? And I think that's where that, that, that line is from. Yeah. Wow. There is so much. I, I could spend a whole day retreat with you, Haley, just listening to all that let's you have it. to share. It's, let's do it. It's amazing. I, uh, but I want to honor time too here. And I, I just have to say as, as we're coming to the end of this, this chat, just how much I, I do love you. And I mean, just knowing you for so long, you've just really touched my heart with this book that you've created as well. Thank and, you. Uh, yeah. And I, I just want you to also know too, just, I really want you to know just how lovable and amazing you are. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Yeah. Thanks for being on the podcast. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. This was, I would say, a really wonderful first ever podcast experience. I'm hooked. I want to this, do it today. This is amazing. I love the fact that this is your first podcast. I'm, I'm like honored that you're here. It's just yeah. amazing. My first, second interview of the whole thing. First podcast. I'm thrilled. I'm hooked. Sign me up for all of them. Oh, I'm going to subscribe to every podcast you're on now. <laughs> <laughs> Right on. Well, thank you for being here, Haley. It's so appreciate it. Pleasure. All right. Well, that concludes another episode of Let's Connect. And I hope that it's inspired you as much as it has me. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember to subscribe to both the YouTube channel and the podcast channel. And I look forward to you joining me on the next episode of Let's Connect.